I call this meeting of the Conroe Independent School District Board of Trustees to order. Let the record show that a quorum of members is present, that this meeting has been duly called, and a notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meeting Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. The time is 6 o'clock. Uh, item 1, our invocation. I'd like to turn the time over to Mr. Ray Sanders and then for our Pledge of Allegiance to Teresa Wegeman. I invite you, if you so choose, to join me in a moment of silence and then I will close with a few words. In all of our ways, we humbly ask for your wisdom as we make decisions during this meeting. Help us to carefully consider the relevant information. Even if we have different opinions, give us unity. Direct our thoughts, our words, our decisions, and our actions toward the right path. Enable us to think and strategize in ways that will achieve great results. Purify our thoughts and our motives so that each one of us will enter this meeting desiring the good of others. Help us to hear the complete message being communicated by all. Help us not to get distracted. We thank you and acknowledge you. Amen. 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 Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Be seated. Thank you, Mr. Sanders and Mrs. Wagner. Item two for our consent, our excuse me, our citizen participation. Ms. Godfrey, do we have anybody signed up tonight? Yes, we do. All right. Please keep in mind that while this meeting is held in a public forum, the purpose of the meeting is for the Board of Trustees to conduct the business of the district. Those who have registered to address the board must make all comments, all comments to the Board of Trustees and not to the audience not violate the confidentiality of any student. Understand that the board can only act on issues that are posted on the agenda for this meeting. If your purpose for addressing the board is to seek some type of remedy, the board cannot discuss or respond to your concerns until you have compiled with the appropriate district policy, which allows the board to consider the complaints only when complaints have not been resolved administratively. Information about how, how to file a complaint is located in the district's website. Any speaker who does not comply with these guidelines will be reminded of the rules. If the speaker fails to comply, the podium microphone will be turned off and the speaker's comments will not be streamed. To ensure that the board can efficiently conduct the district's business, speakers are limited to two minutes for their comments. Each speaker's time will be displayed on the screen around the room. When the countdown timer reaches zero, the next speaker will be called. Please refrain from applauding or cheering after speakers as this delays the remarks of the next individual and impact the efficiency of the meeting. The board expects that everyone in attendance will conduct themselves respectfully, regardless of whether you agree or disagree with the speaker's message. Interrupting speakers will not be tolerated. And before we call our, our first uh, speaker, I know that we've got a lot of people here tonight. I think we have 32 people signed up to speak, which we appreciate. Speaking personally, this is one of my favorite parts of the meeting: is to hear from our citizens. We we respect you and we want to hear from you, um, but we want to make sure that we keep decorum in the room. So I, I ask you to please keep our rules in order. We want to hear from you, but we can't have outbreaks. We can't have the applauding we want to be able to be able to listen to every person and, and hear what you have to say we're good people we don't want to have to ask anybody to leave so please don't put us in that position and with that miss godfrey will you please call our first person virginia hauk and those of you that are speakers you you have been given a number so if this was number one if number two and three would go ahead and line up in the center aisle that way we can keep moving if we can kind of keep that flowing um, throughout the evening that would help us thank you yes ma'am all right oh, sorry that's okay um hello dr no members of the conroe isd school board my name is virginia hauck i'm a former cisd student a former cisd teacher and a current cisd parent 
I believe deeply in the value of public school education, and I'm here to ask you as we face a dramatic new wave of infection caused by the Delta variant of the coronavirus to protect our public schools and everyone inside of them by instating a mask mandate for the entire district. It's truly unfortunate for our entire community that masks have become such a political issue, that masks have, uh, I cannot think of any other simple method of infection prevention that draws such ire. We will put a Band-Aid on our skin, but we won't put a mask on our face. Now that we are living through a massive and unexpected third wave caused by this new variant, with more students reporting positive yesterday than on any day during the entire last school year, and our children who are younger than 12 do not even have the option to be vaccinated, not to mention the continuing struggle of those of all ages who are immune compromised. They need us to do all we can to keep them safe until they are afforded the same level of protection available to all of us in this room who are fully vaccinated, who choose to be. Our governor says now is the time for personal responsibility. I truly wish we could depend on this sense of duty of our fellow humans, but the time to simply trust all members of our community to do what is best for our children and our families and our school district has passed. About a month ago, I moved back to this area, ironically, so my child could be here in time to start school in CISD. We lived in Okinawa, Japan, and I will tell you that every person in the grocery store, everyone in my workplace, every child in every grade of school, every mom at the playground outside has worn a mask since the pandemic started. They wear a mask because they are taking personal responsibility for the collective safety of their community. And this care for others is a value that is not even questioned. Okay, I can hear you saying, but that's Japan, this is America, this is Texas. So let me tell you a story of America coming up on a century ago now. My grandfather, I'm sorry, I have nine seconds left, but my grandfather was in high school driving the school bus to pick up all the kids from a small farm town, and he was able to drive that bus because a bunch of people in that town donated their personal gasoline rations to get that bus moving for the good of the community. Amy Butler. Good evening, my name is Amy Butler and I'm a parent of two children here on Conroe ISD. I'm extremely concerned about the lack of a mask mandate in Conroe ISD. I would like you, the board members, to follow the recommendations of the public health and medical experts and enact a mask mandate to ensure that the schools are a safe place for our children. As you know, COVID-19 cases are rising rapidly in our schools and the Delta variant is more contagious than previous strains. This is coupled with the simultaneous lifting of public health practices, including a mask mandate, social distancing, quarantining, and contact tracing, contact tracing within the schools, all of which has helped stop the spread of COVID-19. Last year, Conroe ISD had a successful year keeping the spread of COVID relatively low because masks were mandated and we saw minimal spread within the schools. We know that masks work based on last year's success. This year, children are getting sick in record numbers. Previously healthy children are going to the hospital in record numbers. And unfortunately, these hospitals and pediatric ICUs are full. We are seeing children spread the virus to unvaccinated parents and caregivers. And then those adults are being hospitalized as well. It is heartbreaking that the lack of a mask mandate for CISD puts children and the community at risk. Both vaccinated and unvaccinated children can spread COVID-19 to others in the schools and in their homes. The American Academy of Pediatrics and the CDC both recommend that all students, teachers, and administrators, regardless of vaccination status, wear a mask to prevent the spread of COVID-19. I understand this may not be the most politically expedient thing to do in this political climate, but now more than ever is the time to put political calculations aside and demonstrate a courage of conviction to do what you know is right for our children. Last year, I was very happy. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Carrie Bigford. Hello, my name is Carrie Bigford and I am the mother of two CISD students. While I empathize with the previous two speakers about wanting a mask mandate, I have a source list that I'm gonna provide you with with 75 peer reviewed studies that show that cloth mask and surgical mask aren't effective to prevent a respiratory virus of this size, such as COVID-19. <coughs> but that's not actually why I'm here. <laughs> I'm actually here to talk about a letter that was sent to you by Dr. Sims this month, trying to coerce the board to um, force vaccines on our children. He actually said, as an expert in the area, I am telling you that the vaccine is safe, very effective, and along with mask utilization, is the only preventative measure we have to decrease the spread of the virus. However, everybody says trust the science, or in this case, the expert, but nobody wants to discuss the data. The data shows that the death rate for healthy children is zero, zero. Is it safe? 
Is the vaccine safe? How can it be safe when the death toll is nearing 13,000 and serious adverse events are 571,830? And there have been 1,272 otherwise perfectly healthy children who have suffered very often permanent or deadly adverse events to COVID-19 vaccines since May. Is it effective? How can it be effective when the singular study endpoint of all the research available is the mitigation of symptoms? It's a therapeutic. It's to mitigate the symptoms. There's no prevention of transmission. There's no reduction of infection. The CDC itself says that. How could it possibly be the only preventative measure to, to prevent the spread of the virus when CDC Director Rochelle Walensky in July of 2021 said that the vaccinated carry the same viral load as, as infected and unvaccinated? High viral load suggests an increased risk of transmission. Vaccinated people infected with Delta can transmit the virus even when asymptomatic. I kind of think the fear of asymptomatic spread is what started all of this to start with, and we're literally creating asymptomatic spreaders through vaccination, so we should really think about that. <laughs> and this is just for the Delta variant. Already we're facing a third shot. Already a third shot, eight months after we began. Thank you, Thank you for your time. Can I get the source list to you? Nisha Weaver. It's the, excuse me for one second. I hate to be this way, but we cannot have these, those outbreaks, any kind of, any of that, we have to run our meetings efficiently. So that was, that is our one warning. Thank you. Thank you. Many of you may know me. I actually ran for school board last year. Board members, your level of arrogance and disengagement from those who elected you to serve is disheartening. I myself know what it's like as a parent to be ignored and have issues swept under the rug. However, I'm not turning blind eye anymore. I'm holding you accountable. If you can't uphold your oath, you should resign. My home is rooted on a Christian foundation and the greatest commandment is love thy neighbor as thyself. CRT has been an ongoing topic the past 10 months. We've heard the blanket statement provided by the board. We've also heard the tape recording. Who do we believe? I graduated in 2004. In fact, Mr. Hines, you were my principal. I didn't recall CRT, so I had to do some research. I think many are misinformed about the actual theory. Black history, it's a vital history of American history, but why wait on legislation to make it right when we can start in our homes? Parents, I get it. The truth needs to be taught, but how can we expect the district that hides the truth to teach the truth? On alternatives should start at home. Having open and honest conversations with our kids, reading books and visiting museums, not a filtered textbook version. I'd rather see classes on mental health money management and etiquette. Get back to implement cursive writing and spelling tests. Our school should be better equipped, students should be better equipped to succeed in life after high school, regardless of color, social disadvantage, or disability. You all make decisions, but how many of you have actually sat down and asked the students or teachers how they are impacted? The school lunches suck, our 504 program is lacking in so many areas, it's embarrassing, and we need more programs available for those who are not college bound. My children are not your social experiment. They have feelings just as you. As a parent, when I hear of issues, I ask myself, what if that was my child? And I ask you all to do the same. If you don't do right, we will vote you out. Thank you. David Katz. <laughs> Melinda Olin. If number seven and eight will line up. Good evening. I'm here as a concerned citizen speaking out against this um, Melinda. shot. And I want to read a, uh, a letter from a parent whose daughter was injured from this. I am brokenhearted. Kennedy, 19, received the second Pfizer vaccine and soon after began experiencing severe chest pain, pressure and shortness of breath. She was brought to the hospital where a team of doctors performed extensive testing and it was determined that she had myocarditis, inflammation of the heart wall. The team said she was the second young adult they knew of this happening to in their area. Kennedy is home now and will continue to be on heart medication for three to six months under the care of a cardiologist. It's unknown whether or not there will be permanent damage to her heart. We had no knowledge this was a possibility, which makes me even angrier this has happened to my child. There's a lot of pressure on this vaccine right now, especially with many colleges saying you must have this to attend classes. 
You try to do the right things for your family and community, but as a result, our daughter may now have permanent heart issues. I only ask you to read this with an open mind and to learn from our experience. Krista, mother. So I don't think these children, um, they don't really uh, have much side effects from this COVID or they get over it very quickly. And so there is really no need for them to get this vaccination. Thank you. Mr. Liu. Uh, number 11 and 12, please line up. We jumped up because the others didn't check in. I didn't know how to count. I'm sorry, so I'm bad. It's okay. And it was 7 to 10. Um, 11 and 12, please uh, line up. Good evening. Good evening. I'd like to thank uh, President Hubert, the other members of the school board, and Dr. No for the opportunity to express my concerns again. And unfortunately, that's not quite the truth. I've been told, unfortunately, I've been muzzled that uh, since I was convinced by two assistant superintendents to file a, a protest of my concerns about my issue, which I can't discuss, that I can no longer talk about that issue in front of the school board. So I can't talk about the issue that I want to talk about. So. I had thought about maybe possibly even you know, rescinding my complaint publicly in front of the school board. Yes, sir, just look, just look at us. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes, sir, no problem. Is there a rule I can't look at the yes. audience? It's or? to us. You're, okay, I'm you're, sorry. You're talking I'm, to us. I'm sorry. That's, okay. I apologize. No problem. Go but, ahead. Um, um, but I decided, you know what, I will give the school board a chance. I'll give the Conroe ISD um, uh, process a chance to see where my complaint leads to. I don't, I'm not very optimistic of what will happen. But again, I will give it a chance since I've already filed the complaint. But next month, if I don't see any results, I may have to rescind it and begin my talk again. Now, I was going to spend about, I don't know why now we can't talk for three minutes, but since I can't, I'm not, I can't talk about my, what I want to talk about, I thought about reading a passage from War and Peace just to use my, my time, but I don't want to waste the audience this time because I know there's 32 speakers and nobody wants to hear War and Peace, but I might do it next time. Um, hopefully, though, this is the last time that I need to speak before the board. However, I'm not optimistic that I'll be allowed to talk about what I want to talk about, so I can't talk about it. So I plan on seeing you again all next month. Now, uh, on the other side, that's 29 seconds left, before I do finish on a, on a totally different subject, I do want to thank the school board and the superintendent, Dr. Noel, for finding a way to keep our children um, for in-person learning during this terrible pandemic. Being a medical professional, I know that this has not been an easy task. Thank you again for your time to listen to my speech that I cannot give. Thank you very much. <laughs> Noah Shapiro. According to Yale medical historian Frank Snowden, the history of epidemics is rife with scapegoating, mass hysteria, and even violence. The European cholera epidemic in the 1830s resulted in the suspension of personal liberties, imposition of a cordon sanitaire, and implicit war against the so-called dangerous classes of society that were unfairly blamed for causing or perpetuating the epidemic. The essentially useless quarantine measures persisted despite the ineffectiveness, ineffectiveness to apparently assuage public panic and discord. Now, nearly 200 years later, we find ourselves in a similar set of circumstances. We must not be swept up by the mob mentality. The voice of the angry mob outside is simply that, a ragtag band comprised of agitators and busybodies outside our community. Do not fall from the canard that equates masking with love. As by extension, this would imply that hateful parents are letting their unmasked demon children run amok through the hallways of CISD schools, remorselessly murdering their grandparents with tainted breath. No! Let's not succumb to such hysteria. Let's use critical thought and reason instead. The data tells us that masks do not prevent transmission of respiratory viruses like influenza or coronavirus. Furthermore, children are likely to be further harmed by extensive mask wearing with potential for physical, mental, and psychological impacts, as well as developmental delays, especially for younger children. At CISD, anyone is free to wear a mask. However, it should be parents and not administrators or board members that should be the ones to ultimately decide what is best for children given their own unique circumstances and beliefs. Mass mandates are an unnecessary and inefficacious usurpation of parental authority and contravene the law here in Texas. I implore the board to ignore the angry mob and continue to do what is both right and lawful to keep our children safe. Thank you very much. Ginger Russell. 
Hi, I'd like to play an audio required through an open meetings I'm request. I'm around uh, critical race theory and the perception that were brought out at the board meeting about social emotional learning and so forth. So I wanted to, uh, like you, Edith, have a united front in answering those questions uh, related to that house bill. But outside of that house bill, I think we need to all have the guidance to help answer questions um, that are not a part of that house bill, but are certainly a part of this whole environment that we are, are dealing with right now. So what I am uh, telling the team is in regard to the some of the presentations at the leadership conference. You know, one is going to be a, about culturally responsive teaching. Uh, Anita and Shalanda will have a presentation on diversity, uh, inclusion, and equity. And then there's a part on equitable learning. So for situations like that, Carrie advised that as long as the presenters are not using any of those buzzwords that were that have been in the media, they will be fine. They might want to start their sessions out and say things such as, I am not, um, this does not represent any personal opinions or beliefs. I am giving this presentation because blank. This board has stated repeatedly that your district is not teaching critical race theory. But you just heard one of your Conroe ISD administrator district staff on how to continue teaching critical race theory despite it being illegal in the state of Texas and goes against Texas law. Sadly, this district, like all districts, are no longer independent school districts. With local, with local control, you've turned over the education of our children to state and federal bureaucracies for the almighty dollar accepting grant funding with progressive mandates. All that you're teaching now, day in every subject is Marxism. Crystal Duvall. All right, I have to recess for just Thank you. Crystal Duvall. My name is Crystal Duvall and I've been a nurse for almost 25 years. I have one child in CISD and she's in fourth grade. I will not waste time on my accolades, but what we're here for, which is to fight for our kids. I know these times can be scary and you're not sure who to trust. There's so much mis uh, misinformation out there, but what I have is backed up and verified about why masks are harmful to our kids. I've given you all copies um, with all of the information on it. Uh, according to an article published in 2020 in JAMA, the SARS-CoV-2 virus has a thousand times smaller diameter compared to the diameter of threads of cloth or surgical face mask. Due to this difference in sizes, the virus can easily pass through any face mask. In fact, after reviewing all the studies worldwide, the CDC found no reduction in viral transmission with the use of face masks. If you look on the box of surgical masks that you bought, it says right on the side of it, does not prevent the transmission of viruses. Additionally, children repeatedly shown not to be the drivers of contagion. It's well accepted that children have a statistically zero chance of dying from COVID. The CDC shows the K through 12 mortality rate from, from or with COVID is 0.0003 percent. Since children have the lowest death rate from COVID infection, the cost benefit of requiring children to wear an investigational face covering with emerging safety, safety data, data issues is especially difficult to justify. Wearing this face mask restricts breathing by increasing the resistance of air. Low oxygen, it also causes low oxygen content, which causes serious heart issues, dizziness, blood pressure, and fainting. Breathing through these face masks also increases temperature and humidity in the space between the mouth and the mask, which is a perfect breeding ground for bacteria. It can cause skin lesions, irritant dermatitis, or worsening acne. And if you don't believe me, look up the Iowa mama bears and the study that was done when parents in Florida submitted their kids' masks for lab studies. Did these sound familiar as reported complaints of any students to the school nurse or the student's parents or legal guardian? Moving on to the psychological effects, Self-harm, suicides, and mental health ED visits are up exponentially. Diane Daniels. Uh, good evening. Uh, Skeeter Hubbard, um, you said publicly last school board meeting that you would contact me. I've never received that phone call. Okay. The past four months, myself and many others have attended these board meetings informing you all of the facts and science regarding the masks. Masks do not work. They cause illness and hurt the children everyone who wears them. Experimental jab, killing people and causing death. CRT, teaching and hating race, hate and racism. Listen to we the people. 
COVID is real. My husband's had it. There are cures for this. But unfortunately, the hospitals have gone into the propaganda and the fear tactic, as I'm afraid most physicians have as well. My concern is that so has the board. You are compromised. You are not doing what is right for the children. You, all of our requests for the past four months have fallen on deaf ears. We have brought you the statistics. We have brought you the studies time and time again the past four and five months. And yet you don't pay attention to any of the science. Why are you not listening to we, the people, who are making these statements? I can only assume that the reason for this is bribes, that you are corrupt and you cannot be, and you can be bought. We, the people, are actively recruiting candidates to replace most of you. The elections for some of you come up in November 2022. This is a fight worth fighting, and I will be back again next month. Our children need an education. They need the masks off. You need to teach reading, writing, and arithmetic and history and stick to that program. We don't need social and emotional learning. We don't need more councils in, the stool, in schools. The parents have the right to decide their child's well-being, not you. You can decide whether they can pass reading, writing, and arithmetic, and science, social studies. That is the expectation, and that's where you need to make sure you stay put. Listen to we, the people. It's our children, and I'm tired of being Jamie ignored. Hill. Good evening, thank you. Yesterday from College Park High School, I received an email. I'm sure it went out to everyone, and I'm just assuming it was under, under the direction of Conroe ISD that our principal sent this out. And it is delaying and canceling some events that we are only one week into school. And I, my concern is that we are looking at you guys canceling our year. And this has to stop now. Parents and students want these events. We want this for our kids. We want them to get to do things. They are, it is important to them. No parent was forced to enroll their child into this, into this school district. We chose it and we knew it this time knowing that we were in the middle of a pandemic. We chose it and we're giving you our children and we want you to empower them. We know they're going to be exposed to large groups. We know that we, we know this. I still let my child do band. I want him to succeed. The last time I was in this room, you guys were honoring him because he had a state level uh, uh, trumpet uh, honor. He wants that opportunity again. I am my child's advocate, so I'm here for him. I'm requesting CISD to stop canceling any more events and provide every opportunity that you can to these kids. We want football games. We want all the competitions. We want our, the, our kids to volunteer and do charitable events. We want our seniors to have senior events. My son's a senior. Canceling these events by you is not necessary. Because we, the parents, we will opt them out when they're not able, when they're sick. Thank you. Penelope Stephan. Good evening, everyone. My name is Penelope Stephan, and I am a current junior at the Willems High School. Due to COVID-19, many vital moments of my high school have been taken from me. Countless pep rallies, sports games, concerts, school dances and club trips have been canceled. And trust me, I'm sick of it. I'd hope that this year would be my chance to have a normal year at school, but unless a mask mandate is put back in place, that will not happen. The prevalence of the Delta variant and loosening of COVID-19 precautions has re uh, released the perfect storm to students in Texas. Just yesterday, the Willens High School reported a staggering 15 new cases and 42 students are currently isolating with a positive COVID-19 test. Even if you do not care about COVID directly harming uh, you and your, or your loved ones, if so many CISD staff get COVID, the subs, there won't be enough steps to properly uh, take care of the schools and our education will falter. The masks are annoying. They're uncomfortable and you have to talk louder to be understood. And overall, they're inconvenient. 
but the alternative is even worse. Without masks, COVID will run rampant through sc schools, specifically harming populations that can't get vaccinated, like students in elementary and intermediate schools. As I said, the masks are inconvenient, but they have been proven to work by organizations such as the CDC and WHO. For the safety of CISD and our surrounding community, we must join with Austin ISD, Dallas ISD, Houston ISD, and many, many others and re-implement the mask mandate. It's time to take the community as a whole into consideration. It's time to mask up. Thank you for your time. Trisha Danto, number 19 and 20 will be next. Hi, my name is Trisha Danto, and first off, I would like to present you with a petition signed by 2,581 concerned parents imploring you to follow the CDC guidelines and institute a ma mask mandate in CISD. But I'm here for my three little girls. They love school. They love going to school. Last year was great. They had a great year. But today they're home. They're not in school. We have health issues in my family. And our pediatrician told us it was not safe for them to go to school unless there was a mask mandate. So we've been pushed online because it's not safe for them to go to school because they have health issues. And I'm grateful for the option to go online, but kids don't learn online, especially in second grade. I want to get them back in school. And what frustrates me the most is I was so proud of our district last year. We did an amazing job. We figured out what works to keep our buildings open, to keep our kids safe, to keep our prom, our homecoming, our meet the teacher, all these important events. We know what to do. And now here we are, cases are rising, people are getting sick, teachers are getting sick, we're bumping meet the teacher back already, things are already getting canceled. So we know what we need to do. We know what works. We know how to put out this fire. So my question to you is, are you willing to put all these politics aside to protect our children, to protect our community, and do the right thing? Can you do the right thing for us? Where can I hand this to you guys? Thank you. I'll take it. I'll pass it. Thank you. Thank you. Emily James. Members of the school board, thank you for hearing me and everyone else here today. I appreciate it. Um, I'm a registered independent. I'm the executive editor and head researcher for Reeves Law Firm. I was the interim director of the American Pediatric Society in 2017. I'm the mother of two students in Connor ISD. One student is autistic and has severe sensory issues. I myself have reactive airway disease as well as a couple of other underlying conditions, which leaves me exceptionally vulnerable to respiratory illness and have low oxygen intake. We have been wearing masks in all public settings for 18 months, both of us with no adverse effects. Public health is not a personal choice, nor should it be political. In 1905, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled in Jacobson versus Massachusetts that the minority cannot control what is done for the health and safety of the majority, furthering the point that the state is allowed to do things its public does not approve of. If it's an informed decision that is in the interest of health, safety, morals, and the general welfare of the inhabitants, it is notable that this was the case in which the court upheld the authority of states to enforce compulsory vaccination laws. Moreover, legally, nobody has a right to not wear a mask. It's not a right guaranteed in any constitution or law we have. What Governor Abbott has done by signing an anti-mask mandate is not logical, reasonable, or defensible under long-standing court precedent. There are numerous laws dating back to the Founding Fathers that address public behavior uh, being compelled to comply with public health measures as laid down by governments during any epidemic. According to the CDC and all confirmed, not Facebook data, the Delta variant is actively comprising herd immunity. Herd immunity is not achieved by everyone catching the virus. It is only possible through layering public safety measures such as mask, masking, which notes not prevent it entirely, but it slows it down. And for those people who are vulnerable, who we should value as highly as we though, do those who are not vulnerable, uh, it can be life-saving. Please enforce a mask mandate in this county. I plead with you. Thank you. Anne-Marie Kennedy. <laughs> Hello. Um, 
I'm not here for my usual reason. Um, I'm Anne Marie Kennedy, a registered nurse and a member of the community now because I'm a mom of a 2020 graduate. Please note that four out of three people have trouble with math. We are not as truly as informed as the MDs treating patients in the ICUs. I don't care to listen to the internet trained epidemiologists, nor the constitutional scholars from Parler, nor the YouTube educated virologists, and I'm exhausted from simply trying to explain how the mask I wear protects you and the mask you wear protects me. It's all medically sound. It's how nurses do dressing changes so that we don't share anything and you don't give anything to us. Um, and it's, the very, it's a very easy way to demonstrate how I love thy neighbor. For all intents and purposes, our hospitals are at maximum capacity. I'm unwilling to argue over that one bed at Methodist or that one bed in ICU without a vent, but a BiPAP is available, nor the beds that become available because of deaths and two of the 60 people who are waiting in the 20 bed ER can now have a bed. The levels of severity of, Conroe, or of COVID infections that Conroe ISD has adopted is alarming. Masks aren't even listed as a suggestion until level five. This is as poorly planned as waiting to go shopping for hurricane preparations while all of the roads are flooded and you are waiting for Jesus to save you from the rooftop. Thank you, Ms. Kane. Tom Reed. I am a double board, board certified medical and surgical specialist practicing in Conroe for the last 37 years. I am also an author, a researcher, most recently publishing an online consumer manual with five other doctors, including a world-renowned cardiologist, epidemiologist, and internist entitled Home-Based COVID Treatment. As a matter of current and historical epi epidemiological facts about viral infections, in all likelihood, this virus will not go away with any current therapeutic course of action. Virologists and other experts have warned that Introducing a vaccine in the middle of an outbreak can actually make the situation worse by facilitating the development of resistant strains, which is exactly what we are seeing at this point. The research also suggests that vaccinated people who are subsequently infected with a mutant strain can also become symptomatic or asymptomatic vectors for transmission of COVID and others. The CD, CDC admits this. For example, 74% of those in a Cape Cod um, Massachusetts cluster of infections were vaccinated. The vaccine will not stop a vaccinated person from contracting or transmitting it to others and um, also caused an 82% increase in spontaneous abortions in women less than 20 weeks pregnant. The inventor of the mRNA vaccine technology itself, Dr. Robert Malone, has spoken out against this vaccine and even stated that females 12 to 17 years old were 72% more likely to die from the COVID vaccine than the disease itself. How effective is this vaccine? Nearly zero. The average absolute risk reduction is only 1%. 1%. Relative risk reduction, which is what the vaccine companies will tell you is 94%, but that is, does not reflect the true numbers. 1% true effectiveness versus 94% re reported effectiveness is a huge discrepancy and gives the general public Thank a you, dangerously skewed Reed. view and false sense of Thank security. You. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. Evangeline Reed. Yes, thank you. So I'm here to respond a little bit to Dr. Sims' letter advising you that the vaccine is safe. Um, and the reports from the government's own flawed and underreported VAERS system shows the number of deaths related to COVID-19 vaccine are at um, just over 12,000 dead in just eight months. That's three times more than the total vaccine-related deaths combined over the last 20 years. So all the other um, vaccines combined don't equal a third of the deaths that we've had from COVID 
vaccine so far. And now there's a whistleblower from within the CDC who signed an affidavit for a lawsuit stating that the number of deaths is not really like 12,000, but more like 45,000, but they're hiding those numbers. And so that, that lawsuit will be going through the courts. As serious as that is, what should also get our attention is the growing numbers of heart damage, which we heard a story of earlier today, or this evening. Those cases in young people, young adults and school-aged children, 18 and under, children generally do not contract or spread this virus to others, and they have a survival rate of 99.997%, uh, but they are greatly at risk from this injection. I do not understand how Dr. Sims can advise you all that this vaccine is safe and that the school district should in any way encourage the vaccine for children 18 and under. And so we do have to choose the experts that we listen to. And there are a variety on a wide range of opinions on this. And so I would encourage other experts, such as Dr. Malone, who invented the mRNA technology, Dr. Peter McCullough, a world-renowned cardiologist, epidemiologist, and internist, who's written the most referenced journal publication on COVID, Dr. Mike Yaden, former VP for Pfizer, who knows directly how dangerous this vaccine is, and other virologists, research scientists, pathologists, and other doctors, from pediatricians to immunologists who have actually looked at the science, and they all say the same thing. Children should not be getting this vaccine. We should not be recommending it for children, period. Thank you. Marcus Adamick. Five seven 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 West Seven in North McCordsville, Indiana. Um, to, to address your comment, gee, it's hard to believe we're 18 months into this and still having a problem. And I would suggest the reason we still have a problem is because we're doing things that are not useful, and we're getting our sources of information from the Indiana State Board of Health and the CDC, who actually don't bother to read science before they do this. Um, I'm actually a functional family medicine physician. That means I am specially trained in immunology and inflammation regulation. And everything being recommended by the CDC and the State Board of Health is actually contrary to all the rules of science. So the things you should know about coronavirus and all other respiratory viruses, they are spread by aerosol particles, which are small enough to go through every mask. By the way, the literature that supports all of that is in a flash drive that we presented to you. It's been given to the secretary. As a matter of fact, it quotes at least three studies <laughs> sponsored by the NIH to that exact fact, even though the CDC and the NIH have chosen to, to ignore the very science that they paid to have done. Um, that is why you keep struggling with this, is because you cannot make these viruses go away. The natural history of all respiratory viruses is that they circulate all year long, waiting for the immune system to get sick through the winter or become deranged, as has happened recently with these vaccines, and then they cause symptomatic disease. Because they cannot be filtered out and they have animal reservoirs, and this is a very important point, no one can make this virus go away. The CDC has managed to convince everybody that we can handle this like we did smallpox, where we could make a virus go away. Smallpox had no animal reservoirs. The only thing it learned to infect was humans. That's why we were able to make that virus go away. That will not happen with this any more than it will with influenza, the common cold, respiratory syncytial virus, adenoviral respiratory syndromes, or anything else that has animal reservoirs. So the reason you can't do this is because you're trying to do something which has already been tried and can't be done. Equally important is that vaccination changes none of this, especially with this vaccine. And I would hope this board would start asking itself before it considers taking the advice of the CDC, the NIH, and the State Board of Health, why we are doing this. Thank you. Paulette Adamick. Do for the common cold, influenza, or respiratory syncytial virus. And then ask yourself, why is a vaccine that is supposedly so effective having a breakout in the middle of the summer when respiratory viral syndromes don't do that? And to help you understand that, you need to know the condition that is called antibody-mediated viral enhancement. That is a condition done when vaccines work wrong, as they did in every coronavirus study done in animals on coronaviruses after the SARS uh, outbreak and done in respiratory syncytial virus, where a vaccine used in a vulnerable individual done the wrong way, which why it cannot be done right for a respiratory virus, which has a very low pathogenicity rate, causes the immune system to actually fight the virus wrong and let the virus become worse than it would with native infection. And that is why you are seeing an outbreak right now. And in fact, in that flash drive you're going to have coming to you and in the emails with six extra, will be a study showing that 75% of people who had COVID-19 positive symptom cases in Barnstable, Massachusetts outbreak were fully vaccinated. Therefore, there is no reason for treating any person 
vaccinated any differently than any person unvaccinated. You should also know that no vaccine, even the ones I support and would give to myself and my children, ever stops infection. In 2014, there was outbreak of mumps in the National Hockey League. The only people who came down the symptoms were the people who were unvaccinated or unknown vaccine status. Boy, that sounds like a great argument for vaccines. But a question that you should ask yourself, knowing that half of the people who came down with symptomatic disease had no contact with an unvaccinated or unknown vaccine status individual, where did they get the disease? And the answer was from the vaccinated individuals. No vaccine prevents you from getting infection. You get infected, you shed pathogen. This is especially true of viral respiratory pathogens. You just don't get symptomatic from it. Thank so you. you Linnea Moore. Good evening. First, I want to thank you for your dedication to our schools and kids. As a former educator, I know what it's like to be on the other side of the table. I appreciate your accrued time and your attention now. Tonight, I come to you as one of many concerned parents over the issue of potential mask mandating in our schools. I would like to lay out reminders of the sound evidence that mask mandating is unnecessary. Decades of virology studies have already shown that all respiratory viral particles, including COVID-19 and its variants, are small enough to pass through paper and fabric materials, rendering the masks ineffective at preventing transmission. Masks are not preventing viruses, they're putting our kids at greater risk. Microbial studies performed show that after a mere 20 minutes, masks worn are a breeding ground for bacteria, yeast, and fungus. With the high frequency that mask wearers are touching their faces, the alleged efficacy of the mask is compromised, and potentially more viral or bacterial elements are transmitted. Psychologically, it is clear the emotional effect these restrictions have had, their primary being fear. Fear should never be the driving, controlling force behind a decision. Academically, children will miss social cues and nuances from their teachers or expression and enunciation during instruction. Developmentally, a recent study revealed that children born and raised under pandemic restrictions have significantly reduced verbal, motor, and cognitive skills. Let me close by appealing to basic individual freedoms to make an informed decision on how to handle our own personal health and those of our children. The CDC reports that to date, Children's, children ages 0 to 18 only account for 0.001% of deaths due to COVID and less than 15% of all cases. As of last Wednesday, 423 children have died from this virus. To put that into perspective, compare that to the 636 kids that died in car accidents in 2018. That means that when you get in the car to drive your child to school, he or she is more likely to not return home from that day than they are to contract and die from this virus, masked or not. Seraphin Farias. Good evening. Um, I'm an ER physician, uh, 11 years experience. Uh, I've been battling COVID uh, since the beginning. Um, I saw COVID patients yesterday. I'll probably be seeing COVID patients tomorrow. Uh, I'm a native Texan. Uh, both my parents were teachers, fourth grade. Uh, my dad taught high school drafting. I have four kids in um, Conroe ISD, kinder through seventh grade. I uh, worked through all the waves when we were first seeing elderly patients, mostly in nursing homes. Then it started infecting those that were 50 plus. Then I started seeing patients between 20 and 50 years old. And now for the past three or four months, I've been seeing uh, kids. Just around five or six days ago, I saw uh, a four-year-old um, that had it. <clears throat> the way that my experience has been is once someone gets this virus, it spreads in households, it spreads quickly. I've seen families that have been able to not let it spread within the household but most are unfortunately not successful. My experience with COVID is it has changed. When it first came out, it was not very infective, but with this new variant, it's much more infective and spreads easily or easier. It, it has a much higher transmissibility rate. I know we'll be fine in the end, 
but at this time I worry through this pretty impressive third wave. Uh, I worry about our community and I worry about our kids. Thank you. Thank you. Helen Erickson. Hi, my name is uh, Helen Erickson, and I have two children. They all grown up and uh, graduated from uh, Colorado ISD a long time ago, 10 <clears throat> and 12 years ago. And uh, I, during that time, I, my children, they are very happy, and uh, um, we, they, we, we, we have a lot of friends from all different colors, and uh, I, and I don't know why this. I mean, since last year, the the critical race of uh, theory come up. This is totally wrong. This is totally, absolutely Nazi and the socialism. Let me tell you my story. I came from China 33 years ago, and my childhood uh, during the Cultural Revolution, and my family being classified as a shamed class because my father, he was a well-educated engineer, and he was put in prison just because he does, he's not a CCP member, and he's a good uh, engineer and <coughs> making his uh, document and uh, to, put, to, 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 to increase the, uh, the factory uh, um, manufacture the, the production. That, became, that became his uh, evidence against him. So he was uh, put in jail in front of me. I was only four years old. And since then, my education opportunity being deprived I, I, I was not allowed to go to the class of, as a regular student. And I was put in a special class with, with the family, the, the parents are having problem. That is a socialism. And now we are, I don't, I don't know why suddenly this, uh, in America, now we have this teaching in the classroom. This is a totally anti-Christ. And the, who, I, I, I mean, school has no authority teaching that in classroom to the children. That harmed the children psychologically, physically, and emotionally. Randy Park. Randy. Good evening. I'm a father of three kids, all under 12. They're not eligible for the vaccine. They got to go to school. I got to send them to school. I'm a working, I'm a working parent. My wife is a working parent. I have no choice. I'm asking you to protect our kids that are under 12. Let me make a real choice. Let me either have them vaccinated and send them to school in their own masks and have everybody else not wear a mask, or please help me by putting a mask mandate in place until they, ha they are eligible for the vaccine. I understand that there are risks. I understand that masks are not 100% effective. I understand that there is a very small chance that they might die, but it is a small chance and it is very real. As far as I understand, we are running out of pediatric beds in the city of Houston in all areas. People have to travel 100, 200, 300 miles away to find care for respiratory treatment for their children as young as 11 months. I understand the risks. I'm asking that you help me make a choice. Put masks in place at least until the vaccine is available for these kids. In elementary schools, they're all under 12. They're all unvaccinated. I'm asking you to protect them. Thank you. Thank you. Daryl Kinsey. Uh, this is my first time at a school board meeting. Moved from California here last year. Um, I guess at a school board meeting, I'm kind of having a, a hard time listening to people focus on things that have nothing to do with really education and what's going to happen beyond COVID. I'm a concerned grandparent. I have twin seven-year-olds, 11, 12, two 16-year-olds in the Conroe ISD. I'm not concerned about adults whose opinions are cast in stone. I'm concerned about pli the pliable mind of our students. Our kids' minds are more important than masks. Character, curriculum, and careers will outlive COVID. Our kids won't major in COVID. I'm concerned about destructive issues and topics being brought into the classrooms across the country dealing with critical race theory. It's harmful, destructive, divisive roots, and it's got nothing but uh, bad intentions. 
critical queer theory to confuse and steal the mind of our children away from how they were created and who they were created by. The LGBTQ agenda, gender dysphoria, access to restrooms and shower facilities that are opposite of the gender that students were created and born into, drag queen storytelling sessions, trans individuals being celebrated in classrooms, assemblies, career days, health and sex education classes, Pol political issues being discussed and pushed in classes where the subject matter has nothing to do with politics. Administrators and or teachers who would describe themselves as anti-God, a traditional family, family period, and country. It's the job and task of our educational professionals to prepare our students to learn what they need to master at each level of instruction in the graduations of standing young people in this community. Their job should not be to try to shape or form their minds to accept perverted, sick, evil, toxic, destructive, hateful messages from those who stand before them every day who can either build up or destroy their passions, hopes, desires, innocence, talents, gifts, and futures. I ask you to please uh, don't let this become where I came from California, the LAUSD, Los Angeles Unified School District of Texas. Thank you, praying for you. Thank you. Alex Silva. Members of the board, thanks for this opportunity to speak out. Um, it's really difficult to get a chance now to, it's like a, we have to take uh, sides. I don't wanna take a side. This thing about the vaccine or the mask is more like a political issue. I don't want to take a side. I, don't, I want to take the, the decision for my kids. I have three children in the Conroy SD, and I, I request you to think as a parent. Is our decision to, uh, if our children wear masks or not, if they get vaccination or not, is not the government vaccine. I know you have a lot of pressure. Don't think about it. Think about the most important uh, uh, part of the uh, society, which is the family. I come from the uh, uh, country in South America, and I lost the damage of the Marxist or the communist situations. And I see that it's coming in this country. Think about our freedom. Don't lose our freedom. And you have an important part in this uh, situation. So give us the, the power. We have the power to decide what to do with our children. So think about it. Thank you. Anna Lani. Dear Board of Trustees, I am the mother of three children under 12 currently enrolled in CISD, one of whom has asthma and a 504. I am requesting that Conroe ISD implement and enforce the federal mask mandate on CISD buses. The executive order applies to all transportation, including intrastate travel, and therefore applies to CISD transportation of students. I understand CISD's position is such that they will not require masks on buses due to the governor's executive order. However, the federal mandate for masks on public transportation preempts the governor's order due to the supremacy clause of the United States Constitution, Article 6, as well as Gade versus National Solid Waste Management Association, 1992. Where, a where the federal mandate and the governor's order conflict, the federal law supersedes the conflicting state regulation, meaning the state regulation cannot be enacted in a way that conflicts with the federal mask mandate on transportation. In addition, August 13th, Secretary of Education Miguel Cardona sent a letter to Governor Abbott and Texas Education Agency Commissioner Morath outlining that by not following CDC and Department of Education guidelines, local education agencies such as Conroe ISD are at risk of losing federal funding. As you are also aware, the governor is also being challenged for violating the rights under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Conroe, ISD, Conroe ISD's COVID mitigation policies unequally affect students who are low income, disproportionately students of color or limited English proficiency, medically at risk or disabled, and children under the age of 12 who are ineligible for vaccination. As a result, CISD opens itself up to heightened scrutiny Garrett Costello. Thank you. Garrett Costello. Oh. <clears throat> Thank you. Hello, board. Hello, Curtis. Um, second meeting here. Okay, just 
looking at the names. Okay, so I'm a father of three in CISD, and I'm requesting that masks are not mandated. For those that want to have the mask, they can have the mask. They can wear the mask. I have no issue with that whatsoever. Um, I repeat, my request is that they are not mandated. A gentleman spoke last month at this board meeting in reference to John Hopkins University study where 100% of the 350 children COVID mortalities had serious medical conditions like leukemia. So those are the kids that are really impacted. If my kid has leukemia, he's staying home, right? So according to the CDC website, I'm not trying to be insensitive here, but that would be the case for me. The flu mortalities can be as high as 1,200 kids per year. So does this mean there's mask forever? Children, I plan on three minutes, not two, so. Children wearing masks tend to breathe through their mouth, not nose. Mouth breathing is known to cause dental problems, as well as cranial facial growth and development problems. There has been no long-term studies of the effects of mask. Uh, moreover, this mask is known to be ineffective by reading the box that it does not help with viruses. And this is the highest level of this type of mask. It's a level three. So why is the burden of proof on me? Like, why do I have to show you the proof to not have a mask mandate? I would challenge you to not just take the talking points of the CDC or Dr. Fauci on Sunday morning, but let's look at the data with schools that have masks and schools that didn't in the same region. And there, from what I'm seeing, there's no difference in case counts. So we have known this virus for a long time, right? 18 months. So we have enough information out there to make educated and informed decisions rather than talking points. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Carrie Daly. Hi, um, I'm a parent of two kids in CISD. First, I wanna thank Dr. Knoll because you're in a really tough position and I appreciate everything that you're doing this year and last year. There's a lot of changes because we were expecting to have a normal year this year and it just kind of changed all of a sudden, didn't it? Um, I, I wanted to just make a statement to the, all of the board members. Um, we all expected to have everything go back to normal this year. Um, unfortunately, the COVID rates rose over the past few weeks and uh, we, it requires those in power to put some precautionary measures back in place. This will keep businesses and schools going. CSD needs to mandate masks in schools for the time being just to reduce transmission in our community and protect those who are too, who are too young or too immunocompromised to be vaccinated. Even vaccinated individuals can spread the virus to the unvaccinated and the new variant is hitting our community swift and hard. Masks offer another layer of protection to hopefully keep businesses and schools open, but without it, we will prolong the effects of our economy and our population, on our economy and population. We know that children do best in person, and masks can help keep kids in school until we get through this. A number of school districts across Texas, including Dallas, Austin, Spring, and Galveston, have made the moral and ethical decision to mandate masks in the last few days. We hope you could do the same, but we also understand you're under some, um, you're in a predicament. So um, we hope that you can make some uh, good decisions for everyone, but please listen to the hospitals, listen to the doctors, look at the data, and then look into the eyes of our children and say that you won't do something simple to protect them. We want this over with. Our children do too. Mask wearing is a minor inconvenience to stop this from lingering longer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Jennifer Teague. <clears throat> Shay Davidson. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Shay Davidson. I have five kids in four different CISD schools right now. Next year, it'll be five kids in five, wow. which I'm really excited about. <laughs> um, we love CISD. We've been through many schools. We have awesome relationships with our teachers and administrators. I'm a huge fan of this school district. And I want to start off, oh, I have kids at Galatas. <laughs> um, I want to start off by saying thank you so much for the time and the love that you've put into this. 
Um, I know that it's not easy. You have parents coming at you from every side, and it's not just tonight. I recognize that it's every day and the thousands of emails that you're receiving, so thank you. Um, I am here to also thank you for standing with Governor Abbott and getting our kids back in school in the most normal way that we can. I want to present to you the concept that it is possible for you to support the idea of something, but also strongly support people who refuse it and strongly support their right to refuse something. Um, if you are a mask advocate, if you feel safer with a mask, I support you. And I understand because we get a lot of conflicting evidence. But at the same time, I will stand side by side with any parent who wants to exercise their right and their responsibility to do what's best for their child by refusing a mask. And this is a concept that America's built upon. It's the idea that we can all coexist with people that we deeply disagree with. And we can, in fact, make the choices that are best for each of us. This concept can be applied to vaccines as well. I have several vaccines myself, but I will fight to the death to defend the right of parents who want to refuse that vaccine. I would ask that you remain steadfast in supporting families to do what's best and make the decisions for their children. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President, that's the last registration I have. Okay, very good. That, that concludes our citizen participation. I want to say thank you. Thank you to all of you guys for, for just how you conducted yourself. I appreciate that. Board, would we like a, a, a recess? Yes. Okay, very good. We'll, we'll go into recess at this time. Okay, thank you for that. I will... We will resume our meeting at 717 and moving on to item three, consent agenda. I have not heard from anybody to withdraw anything, so do we have a motion? Move approval, consent agenda is presented. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Show of up of the hand. Any opposed? Same sign. Very good. Brian passes. Item four, uh, planning and construction. Cons I, a, consider acceptance of the safety and security 2020 construction project. Dr. Noel. Thank you, President Hubert. And just for the sake, I know I had some conversation out there. I was asked this question. There is no item on the agenda tonight about masks. So if you're waiting for the mask item, that it does not exist on tonight's agenda, just to be clear. I, I was asked that when I was out there. I just wanted to make, I don't know if everybody had a chance to see the agenda. Okay. Um, Mr. Foster, you'll come forward, present our items. Good evening, President Hubert, members of the board, and Dr. Noel. At this time, I'm <coughs> Pardon me. Bring forward for your considerance and acceptance as complete our safety and security 2020 construction project. So this 2020 installment of our safety and security project is the work has been completed. We've done the financial analysis, reviewed subcontracts, change orders, and all the other things that we do to make sure the numbers add up. Uh, the $4.249 million contract has been completed. We've got a returned contingency and savings amount of $36,523.58. This time we're requesting your approval as accepted and complete. So moved. We have a motion. Second the motion. We have a motion and a second. Any questions or, or discussion? Nice right. discussion. Say good job on saving us money. Yeah. Very nice. So, so point of order, is that money we gave them that we got back or just money we never gave them? It's money we never gave them. So okay. It, it is so it was in the budget. We just didn't spend it. Correct. Okay. Thank Very you. Good. All right. All those in favor? Show my uplifted hand. Any opposed? Motion passes. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Item B, select job order contract as a procurement method for Austin Elementary. And the rest of that, Dr. Noel. Yes, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you uh, for that. It is a long title, but it is uh, asking uh, for a couple of items to be approved. So it's an order uh, asking for the approval to use job order contracting as a contracting method for this work and it's asking you for the approval of GTT Construction, one of the awarded job order contract vendors to do that work uh, for the amount that they've uh, put together for us. So this work is for uh, to remove our improvements from the right of way at TxDOT Highway 105 right in front of Boston Elementary. So if you recall about a year ago, uh, TxDOT purchased right of way from us. Uh, so the proceeds from that sale will cover the design and the construction for what we're asking for you tonight. Uh, so we're asking for you to approve one is the uh, job order contract method and two is uh, GTT as the award vendor in that program to do the work 
uh, to remove our improvements from uh, the TxDOT right of way uh, for uh, an amount of $195,000. We knew the work was coming. We didn't know when the Highway 105 widening project was going to commence. We received notice about three weeks ago that construction is imminent and they've given us till the end of October to remove our, our improvements from the right of way. So we're requesting your approval of this work so that we can do just that. Okay. Do we have a motion? So move. Do we have a motion? Do we have a second? Second. All right, I have a motion and a second. Any conversation? Question. Yes, sir. C can you can you give me a little more about the scope of work? What all has to be moved? I know there's the great big monument sign out there. Yes, sir. I mean, there's the. I'm just going to kind of start. We're going to be the, knocking down some trees. Well, we won't be knocking down the trees. Texas I will take care of the trees within the right of way. We're we're We've been asked to, because TxDOT purchased all the items that are in the right, right. way from us. Right. Uh, so with those proceeds, we're going to reestablish some of those items we need in the new, uh, our new, on our side of the new right of way. So the monument sign is one of those. Uh, so the monument sign was got a brand new LED marquee in 2018 in it. <laughs> we're able to retain that and reuse it. Okay. Uh, we're also working on the uh, underground utilities that serve the campus. So that's the water service from the city. Uh, the fire water service from the city, those things have to be moved out of the right of way. Our fence moves out of the right of way, and we've got six parking spots that are actually in mm -hmm. the old right of way, and so we're going to recreate those outside of the right of way. So the total of all that work together from the east side to the west side is approximately $195,000, and the GTT was, <coughs> is, is, was the original contractor on that site. So we picked them as the Well, uh, I think right. that's yeah. by far the best, best choice. I was just trying to understand if we sold in the right way, why wouldn't we let them knock everything down? But it, you're telling me now it's because we want to try to reuse and save some money for the district to be able to take those items out. And if we do that and move them, then we can do that. Well, it's really the reconstruction of those. It's like the right, marquee sign. Right. If they knocked it out, it's gone forever. Absolutely. We want a marquee right. sign. Absolutely. So we're going to use their proceeds it. to build a new one. I get it. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Yep. Foster. Well done. Any other questions? Uh, how much did we receive for the sale of the right away? Do you know? Uh, approximately two hundred and eighty-one thousand dollars. So we got two hundred and eighty-one, and then it's costing us one hundred ninety-five to. Well, we also have some engineering expenses. So there's about twenty thousand dollars to our designers for this program, and then there's uh, going to be some soft costs associated with reimbursables and surveys and some other things that that will happen. But it'll be well under the two hundred eighty-one thousand. Okay, thank you. It was Good about question. what ten. 10 feet? I can't remember how much the right, it wasn't a lot. No, it, I mean, it averages about 10 feet, so it is not so, much, yeah, but it's, yeah. it's uh, there's some significant items that have to move Absolutely. about 10 yeah. feet. Yeah, because mm. that's right next to the road. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, I'll call the vote at this time. All those in favor? Very good. Any opposed by the same sign? All right, motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Foster. We'll move on to item C, receive capital improvement updates. All right, Mr. Foster. At this time, I want to bring you up to speed on our capital improvements we have underway throughout the district. I'm going to begin with York Junior High School. If you'll recall, this is a project uh, that increases the overall capacity of York Junior High. Uh, we've been telling you it's on schedule. It's scheduled to open for school, and it did. Uh, students are using that facility uh, for school and started on the first day without, without any issues. So that project is essentially uh, complete from a construction standpoint. Our contractor will be on site with us for another couple months doing punch lists and detail work and make sure everything is uh, fit and fine for our, our long and uh, continued use of that building. Uh, and then as we get that done, we'll work through the financial review and hopefully bring back to you in the near future for a full acceptance as complete uh, for final payment. At the Woodlands College Park High School, and another building addition to help us increase the capacity of that campus, just like York, it opened for the first day of school uh, last Wednesday uh, without issue. You can see uh, from the inside, and some of my pictures are before school started. But this is the uh, aquatics lab on the inside. I mean, like just like at York, uh, it finished. Uh, will our contractor be on site for another month or so doing punch list items and, and wrapping up their uh, detail work in the evenings and weekends, and then we'll begin the financial closeout and bring that forward in the near future for final acceptance is complete. Uh, at the Woodlands High School, another building addition project we uh, uh, opened last Wednesday. Uh, on time, our students are using that facility as well. Uh, and like our other two projects, the contractor will be on site with us for another couple of months, wrapping up the, the finer details in the evenings and weekends. Uh, and then we'll begin the financial closeout process and bring that to you in the near future for final acceptance as well. 
Uh, one of the th features on the inside of the woodlands that didn't happen, I mean, because it had previously happened in College Park, was a, a reorganizing of the front entry. So we've given our uh, front office staff uh, the safety and security uh, uh, items that other campuses did uh, have uh, had before them. So that was happened with the, the Woodlands High School as well. And then our, you know, like the others, we've got full and complete uh, classrooms in use by those students uh, since school started last week. Our campus renovation project at Armstrong Elementary, which was the main focus for the summer, was getting the kitchen uh, increased in size and capacity to better serve the student population, and that opened on Wednesday uh, last week. Um, so they did serve breakfast and lunch on the first day of school and have uh, since. Our contractor on that site will be on site for another couple months doing the completion of the work for the two classrooms uh, that we added and the teacher's lounge uh, so we can get those items done and in use for the for the school so they'll be with us for a couple months wrapping up those details and then we'll be closing that project out it is on schedule and has happened as we uh, intended it to happen uh, another part of the campus renovations project was the air conditioning upgrades at riot elementary so it's a, i say air conditioning it's everything above the ceiling it's the safety and security upgrades uh, uh, everything associated with the fire alarm and the radio systems and and all those other things along with the air conditioning upgrades there i mean you can see from our uh, photo here um, it opens on the first day of school without issue and it looks generally speaking like we were never there so the, except that uh, the rooms are a lot more comfortable now Good and picture. the building operates more efficiently the lighting is better i was there it, the lighting makes a big <coughs> yes sir it absolutely does so it, that project wrapped up on, on time and on schedule uh, it is part of the armstrong project so we'll be wrapping those up financially over the next several months over at Creighton Elementary is an overhaul project, a more intense overhaul of the whole campus. I mean, so we did the air conditioning and above ceiling upgrades uh, this summer. Uh, just like Ride, you can see it got cleaned up for the first day of school. The contractor is still on site and will be on site for, the, for another full year as we work through the fire alarm and infrastructure upgrades on the outside, finish the roof, and work, work our way throughout the rest of the improvements that we're doing in that building. So there's not as much scope happening during this uh, next school year, and it'll ramp up again for next summer but the contractor in, uh, should be on site with some forces evenings and weekends, uh, wrapping up finer details and getting stuff ready for next summer uh, so that we can wrap up that project on schedule and on budget uh, next summer. Then we're gonna move over to our new Moorhead Junior High School, which is the new junior high school that's between uh, Grangeland, uh, Milam, and Caney Creek High School. So you can see I'm giving you a different perspective from that site because you can see now the, the new uh, practice fields, which is a reorientation of the practice fields for Caney Creek High School. Uh, they got a. They they need to have a full growing season on them before we turn the football teams loose on it. <laughs> the football team was released on the the main football field for Caney Creek High School uh, for their football practices at the first of uh, August. So so that project went over well, and now we can focus on the main building and the and the uh, site uh, uh, improvements for the new junior high school itself. Main scope of work for the new junior high currently is a steel erection. Uh, so it is uh, delivering. I mean, we're beginning to experience some of the trucking and other logistical delivery issues with steel that we would expect. Uh, the contractor on that site made a big push early knowing those were coming. Uh, and so they've gotten themselves positioned so they can manage those delays and it's not going to affect the opening of, of that school. Awesome. It's scheduled to open in August of 2023. Conroe High School, which is our big master plan renovation project. You, I've been talking to you all summer about the focus of getting the new parking lot on the northwest side of the campus open. You can see from this nice photo, uh, it is full of cars during the normal school day. We were able to park cars in there on the first day of school. Uh, I would love to say with, without issue, but it was a <laughs> major struggle to get that done uh, leading up to the first day of school. But we were able to make that happen. So you can see uh, all the nice red dirt around it. You can see the building pad taking, taking shape around the existing band hall, which, is, which all becomes our new CTE wing for that new campus when it's uh, completed. Mr. Foster. Yes. Go, absolutely. Th that sidewalk is open for them to, they don't have to go across the dirt, right? They just go through that sidewalk to get to the campus? Correct. We have a, okay. uh, we have a concrete pathway for uh, normal pedestrian traffic that keeps everybody free and clear of the construction zone. Thanks. So what I haven't really shown you a lot of is what's going on inside the building. So you can see here a, a nice shot of the corridor between the oldest sections and the newest sections of the building additions we did in the, uh, the uh, 2017 building addition. So part of our overall overarching theme for this master, master renovation is to bring the whole campus up to the same uh, level of fit and finish. Uh, so over the summer, while they were struggling on the outside with rain, the crews were on the inside uh, uh, replacing tile and painting the walls and making that thing uh, shine uh, for that main part of the oldest part of the building uh, and they did that and it opened uh, without issue for students <coughs> last Wednesday 
Now on the <clears throat> other end of that campus, <clears throat> we're working in earnest on the foundations and structures for the retaining walls that help us mitigate the elevation change across that site uh, as we build the, mm. the new uh, athletic facilities on the, we're gonna call it the east end of that property. Uh, so that's where the focus is currently. As they're doing the foundations there, they'll move to the foundations on the CT wing. Uh, and over the next uh, school year and a half or so, we'll be opening those facilities and starting beginning to transition the programs uh, from one building to the other as we make our way around the campus. Overall, the project is currently on schedule. Uh, we'll be on that campus through the year 2025. So here's just another look at uh, some of the foundation mm -hmm. work. Uh, and it, it's, it's hard to tell the scale because the campus is so big, but big buildings have big, big items, big foundations, big walls. So uh, all those holes there make that truck look tiny. <laughs> So moving on to our new JET Center, which is our at the south, uh, north end zone of our West uh, Wood Forest Bank Stadium complex. You can see from this overhead picture, which is still about a, about a week old, there's been more concrete poured since the picture was taken because we're making our way uh, around the facility to get ready for uh, the football season. Our first scrimmages happen in the stadium this coming Thursday. You can see from our overhead picture here, the school board is lit up. Uh, so it has been uh, activated. Uh, so we actually spoke to our uh, staff here in the building that helps run that system there. They've got the access to it So they're going to be starting to run their test on it here later this week uh, working on uh, a plan B for our sound system so the the finished sound system equipment has been delayed for all the other reasons that things have been delayed here recently uh, but we did retain the old sound system before we uh, uh, Demolished everything so we're putting everything back so we'll have the school board functional and have the sound system a sound system functioning uh, for football season as we go through and wait on those deliveries. Now the building itself is taking shape just like we had anticipated it being. You see we're marching towards the next big milestone of drying in the structure so we begin really working on the inside. Uh, <clears throat> but again our focus for this week uh, is getting the turf la laid down and playable for Thursday. So the, those crews have been working diligently and very hard uh, dodging those afternoon rainstorms. Uh, getting that field back uh, ready for play on Thursday afternoon. Our safety and security project, which is a district-wide effort, this is our 2021 uh, installment. We just uh, got approval to complete the 2020 installment. So this would, likewise, we're gonna begin the closeout process for it. The work uh, is scheduled to, to wrap up uh, at the end of September, and then we'll be bringing for you the 2022 installment for approval to begin working in the next geographical area uh, later this calendar year. You can see here, this is just a picture of the inside of the Vogel's reception area. Most of the things for the project are unseen, so they're cameras, they're upgrades, they're radio systems, fire alarm upgrades, uh, uh, impactors, film on the windows at the reception areas, things of that nature. That work is happening and has been happening. It's a kind of a, a pretty uh, well-oiled machine at this point. The contractor has been with us doing this work for several years and several iterations, uh, so they're continuing to work fairly efficiently, efficiently as they move through it but it is on schedule and moving uh, just as we had hoped. At Gordon Reed Elementary, which is flex school number 21 on the west end of our district, you can see here we're uh, building uh, is coming along very nicely. Uh, the metal deck and the concrete roof deck are being uh, installed as we go through. Last month we talked about masonry being the big scope that's about to start. Uh, you can see uh, it has started in earnest. So you've got a picture of the inside of the building as they're working on the gym and the other high wall areas where the masonry is more intense and they'll make their way across to the, the classroom additions as they, as they progress through the building. It is scheduled to open in August of 2022, and I'm happy to report it is on schedule. At Oak Ridge High School, which is an overhaul of the main campus, which is a 40-year-old uh, set of building systems that need to be overhauled and replaced. Also, we're doing the South County CTE building uh, at this location. So we did spend the summer preparing the inside of the building for the transition of moving uh, chillers and moving piping and creating a central uh, plant for the building. Uh, we worked uh, at the ninth grade center doing a little preparations to make the bus ramp work for bus transitions uh, for uh, arrival and dismissal. That work is in place and we worked on uh, up to the first day of school getting those transitions functioning well <coughs> and then we've started demolition on what you can see uh, right in kind of the middle bottom of the screen is where the old uh, buses where the, the bus ramp where the buses dropped mm -hmm. off before that will be the new location the new admin for that facility as we as we overhaul that whole program so that the project is beginning to take shape on the outside where we can see it 
Meanwhile, stuff happens on the inside and on the overnights and weekends as we continue through that project. We'll be on that project overall for a total of 30 months and is currently on schedule. You can see a better picture of where the new admin front entry of the, class, of the, of the uh, building will be. So you're seeing some infrastructure. So we're moving utilities and gas lines and electrical feeders to the campus currently, uh, but we'll start seeing foundation work hope, in, the near, in the next couple of months as that project becomes concrete and then gets to go in vertical. Mr. Foster, on yes, Oak Ridge, what is the timeline for that road through the middle being shut down? Um, so we are currently working with uh, some conversations with uh, Union Pacific, the railroad. Uh, so we're not we're trying to avoid their right away as much as possible, but uh, uh, we are optimistic we can be outside of it. But just in case we can't, we're having to get some of their permissions. Uh, working through the county, working through some other logistics. I think we've got. I'm trying to be conservative and uh, under promise so we can over deliver. But we look like we're about six months of permitting still left before we can start work on the on the road. Uh, in, in a perfect world, I believe we'll, we'll do that road, uh, most of that work next summer uh, because we've got, we're going to disrupt the practice fields and some of the other things that we don't want to disrupt while there's active season going on. Uh, but we also want to be able to, like we did at Connor High School, we had, it's about the same distance of roadway. Uh, so we want to be able to start and finish it uh, in, in a period so that we, we can acclimate to it for a school year. Um, so once the new roadway is open and the county accepts it then we can go through the process there'll be i'll be back in front of you with right away dedication some other things as that happens uh, but once it's fully ours again and we've dedicated another roadway then we'll be able to close it for good uh, but that's um, i would love to give you a good hard timeline but it's it's a long enough. and lots of red tape in that process uh, real quick on oak yes. ridge you mentioned last month that there was a, a de delivery delay on the critical path and mm -hmm. so was that resolved well, well that's actually not at oak ridge it'll be on uh, my next project oh okay about, yeah. which is <laughs> spoiler wilkerson intermediate school yeah. so uh, uh oak ridge is a is a long 30-month project so we can we can manhandle some of the uh -huh. the supply chain a little bit better there wilkerson is a much shorter project so it's an eight-month project uh, we, we're intending to turn it over in January when we return from the Christmas break, and that's the Christmas break that's only four months away. Uh, so they've been out there working on it. They're working, as you can see from our overhead pictures here, they're working on the building foundations now. Uh, we've also got some work to do inside the campus for the safety and security upgrades and things of that nature, which will, they won't be hampered by uh, what we're, we're, we're looking at from a supply chain delay. What we've looked at is the, or what we've encountered rather, is the metal building, so the steel structure and our short schedule. Uh, we've had success in the past. Uh, what we've in, what the, the metal building manufacturer, we were hoping for a delivery of steel this month in August, uh, which would be typical for the, a project of this size and magnitude. What they were able to deliver is a, a delivery date in October. Mm -hmm. uh, so on an eight month project to lose two months to delivery is, is a bit uh, nerve wracking. Uh, now our contractor has not given up on the idea of finishing the job on time so since we're not spending labor in the beginning we're going to be able to hopefully work a, a multiple crew system mm -hmm. uh, possibly we've, we've talked about working a two shift system which we've got to get some approvals from the woodlands and some other people to be able to do that some of that work at night uh, but if we can do that we can still deliver and, and get our delivery when it's promised uh, we can still deliver the building in january as hoped now the good news is, is we're not displacing students within the building to build this addition. Uh, so if we do get delayed into next spring, it'll, I mean, we should be able to finish it for the next school year. But our promise was January and we're doing everything we can to maintain that promise. Mm -hmm. But as you can see, they are working on the foundation. So the, the building slab will be there and in all, in all likelihood next month, I'll show you a building slab and the next month I'll show you a building slab uh, and then uh, but we should be talking about when steel is arriving uh, by the time we get to October. Awesome. <clears throat> now, Conroe High School, this is a ninth grade uh, uh, campus. It's a, another classroom addition to help us deal with the growing population in the Conroe High School feeder zone. Uh, over the last couple of months, they've been working on the uh, building pad. Now, you can see the foundation work has started in the middle of the campus. I told you last month we uh, expanded the, the width of the bus ramp driveway to make that more service, first serviceable to our uh, transportation department. That uh, has worked very well and the building here is uh, on schedule. So this is another one. By the time we bid this job, we had the news from Wilkerson. Um, so we were able to 
get ahead of the conversations, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So once the bid, part of the bid package was promise of delivery, and currently the steel supply, supplier on this campus has been able to maintain their, uh, at least in, in verbal and communication, maintain their delivery date. So we do anticipate this one finishing in May, so it was a January to, or a, 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 an, an eight month long construction process. So we were anticipating wrapping up construction substantially in May, moving in over the summer and having it ready for the August return of students at the end of the summer break. And that seems absolutely feasible at this point. And that's our update. There's a lot of slope in that too that's, oh, that oh, pictures that's doesn't yeah. really show it. Correct. There's I mean, a lot of slope from the top of that to the bottom. There's a great deal of slope. So from the edge of the parking lot where the touches our building pad to the classrooms on the other end of it so, is approximately eight. 10 feet. That's so about what I was thinking was yes, 10 sir. feet. Yeah. Absolutely. Wow. A lot of engineering. <clears throat> All right, Mr. Officer, thank you very much. Moving on to item 5A, consider award of RFP 21-05-02, Browns Equipment. Mr. Reeves, Rick Ford, for these next three items. <clears throat> Good evening, President Hubert, members of the board, and Dr. Knoll. Tonight we're requesting the board awards RFP number 21-05-02 for grounds equipment to the following vendors, Brookside Equipment Sales Incorporated and Outdoor Equipment Outlet for an annual estimated, annual estimated expenditure of $350,000. Request for proposals pertaining to the purchase of grounds equipment for our maintenance department or email to registered vendors through the CISD e-bidding system and advertised on the CISD purchasing website multiple times in the courier. Unit pricing was requested for standard item grounds equipment and a catalog discount to quote additional equipment and supplies as needed. Contracts with awarded vendors will remain firm through August 31st, 2022, automatically renewing for two additional one-year terms through August 31st, 2024. The proposals were evaluated by our CIC maintenance department and reviewed by the CSD purchasing department. Recommendations for award are noted. At this time, we request your approval. All right. I move approval as presented. We have a motion? Second. second. We have a second. Do we have any questions? I do have a question. You, you said awarded to outdoor and to Brookside. <laughs> yes, um, on the um, rubric you provided, it looks mm -hmm. like outdoor scored the highest on every category. Is there something that we <clears throat> are anticipating purchasing from Brookside, even it's though just, outdoor. I think it's more of just having another option in case they can't get something there. Got it. So, and we have good relationships with both. Okay. So. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. I have one more. Yes, yes sir. You said this was an uh, annual contract we're spending that, or did I hear that correctly? A the annual estimated. Oh, yes, sir. for just one year? Yes, sir. Okay. And it varies from year to year. So this was the high end of the last three years okay. of the contract. Okay. Any other questions? All right, seeing none, call the vote. All those in favor, show by uplifted hand. Any opposed by the same sign? Seeing none, motion carries. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Reeves. On to item B, uh, 5B, consider award of RFP 21-06-01, golf and utility style vehicles. All right, we're requesting the board awards RFP number 21-06-01 for golf and utility style vehicles to the following vendors, Brookside Equipment Sales Inc., Conroe Golf Cars, Golf Cars of Conroe, Outdoor Equipment Outlet, and Professional Turf Products. This is for an estimated annual expenditure of $120,000. The request for proposals pertaining to the purchase of golf and utility style vehicles and service were emailed to registered vendors through the CIC e-bidding system, advertised on the CIC purchasing website, and multiple times in the carrier. Vendors were asked to offer a percentage discount off shelf or catalog prices for the purchase of these vehicles, as well as hourly labor charges for service. We had five vendors submit a response. Contracts with awarder vendors will remain firm through August 31st, 2022, automatically renewing for two additional one-year terms through August 31st, 2024. The proposals were evaluated by the CISD Maintenance Department, the CISD Police Department, the Athletic Department, and reviewed by the Purchasing Department. Recond recommendations for award are noted, and at this time, we request your approval. Okay. Do we have a motion? So moved. Do we have a motion? I need a second? Second. All right. Motion a second. Any questions? Conversation? All right, seeing none, call the vote. All those in favor? Any opposed by the same sign? Seeing none, the vote carries. All right, Mr. Reeves, item C, consider award of RFP 21-04-07, medical stop loss coverage. All right, and so we're requesting that the board awards RFP number 21-04-07, medical stop loss coverage to Stealth Partner Group, who will partner with Sun Life for an estimated annual expenditure of approximately $2,093,139. 
Previously, Conroe ISD awarded the medical stop loss coverage to HM Insurance. In working with United Healthcare, HM Insurance, and Gallagher Benefit Services, it was determined that a contractual agreement could not be reached between HM Insurance and United Healthcare based on a conflict of interest between the two organizations. Mm -hmm. The district's employee benefits consultant, Gallagher Benefit Services, reached out to Stealth Partner Group, who partners with Sun Life, and were actually rated second in the RFP scoring. Gallagher was able to negotiate a total fixed cost fee of $2,093,139 from Sun Life, which is $398,399 less than the fixed cost fee from HM Insurance. The contract will be effective for one year through August 31st, 2002, with an option to renew annually for four additional one-year terms through August 2026. The proposals were evaluated by members of the district's financial services and human resources departments with guidance from Gallagher Benefit Services. Funds are provided in the self-funded health insurance fund, and at this time, we re request your approval. Okay. Move we approve as presented. A motion? I'll second. We have a second. <clears throat> Any questions or conversation? A couple of questions. Yes. Sir. So, um, I want to make sure the phrase is right. So we're saving about 398000 Is there, is this bid different? than their first bid? Correct. Okay. okay. Correct. And so we went back to them. What made them lower? That's, I mean, $400,000, thank you. Is it a full 400 That's what I'm net difference, or is there, there is a, a little difference in the plan, correct? The net, right. the net savings is is what, uh, is, it's a little less than 400 is that correct? So, yeah, the net savings is actually going to be about $48,000. But they did improve on their bid from their original bid, you know, for the Okay. Percent. And it's the same stop loss maxes that were actually, our, our actually men. they're they the HM the coverage max I guess is what I'm asking. One million dollars for right. they up theirs to five million. So we have a better maximum on the stop loss. So we've got a better maximum at a lower cost. Yes, sir. Correct. And a lower mm -hmm. cost to the participants as well. Yes, sir. By quite a bit. Correct. Yes. Is this all because we gave them a second bite at the apple and we kind of yeah. I, I believe so. Just trying to understand. Yeah, <laughs> we'll take it. They, they, I'm glad. they, were, they welcomed yeah, the opportunity. I so, I need to do that and, and, and I think our, I think our, our consultant group, um, you know, went to the table uh, to sell and, and and really battled for us to get this better, this better price. Well, that that's a okay. that's a good point then because I know that we paid Gallagher Gallagher a lot more than we paid previously, but we're forgetting more value for that coverage, then that's well worth it. Absolutely. Okay. Yes, sir. Did you have some other questions? Ms. Um, some of them have, have been asked, but just, it seems, it just seems odd that uh, this wasn't our first choice, but we're getting a better deal now because the first choice didn't work out. Right. I, I, that's right? And, okay. And, and I would just, from my conversations with, with a member of the Gallagher, and, and I want to I want to make sure I get uh, Stealth Partner Group. They were looking to build their portfolio. This opportunity came, and they wanted to impress us. They want to keep us, so they were looking to okay. improve their portfolio. So they took the advantage to impress us and, and gave us this opportunity. I want to get the business. And so okay. when renewal comes, if renewal is not favorable to us, yeah. we'll go right back out to business. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and and I because I'm in that world, so I see that happening from time to time where carriers are trying to enter a market's point, so they'll, they'll do those. But my question is, is, is this still the same um, definitions of, of everything? They're not lasering. Are they, are they lasering now that they didn't before? I mean, is that, is that a concern? This, this does include one laser. So that's, that's kind of a big deal. Yeah, so there, there, is, there, there is one laser. And we have the opportunity with this particular laser that if the employee signs up for a couponing program, um, it will actually remove that laser from it. And, and, it, and it's just an offset of, of medication. You know, their, their, their medications monthly are high, about $150,000 a month alone. So uh, that's how we got to the net of $48,000 profit on that three feet. But, but with, this, with this lasering, if the employee signs up for the couponing, program they will actually disregard the laser and, and, and move forward with us okay so I understand that but there was there was a conflict of interest that's how we got here as well yeah, right conf conflict of interest between HM insurance and United Healthcare 
Okay. And the conflict of interest is that HM Insurance is owned by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Pennsylvania. And United Healthcare would not allow them to see their proprietary contract that they right. have with That makes sense. Yeah. And, and, and the HM Insurance did not, book the minute we called them and said, hey, there's a conflict, they wrote us a letter and said, you're out of, you're out of the contract, no problem. Okay, so I wanna go back to the laser real quick because yes. now it's, it's, it's depending on a third person to do, to do something. It is, yes sir. So I know we're all, I'm uncomfortable with that, I'm sure you are as well. This couponing program, are, are, have, have, I'm assuming we've contacted this coupon company that, that will honor as long as the gentleman or woman or whoever it is, this employee signs up, this will be. Sun, Sun Life is gonna, is gonna head up the enrollment of the employee into that program. And, and it is actually part of um, Obamacare and part of that program, so it is so it is here to stay with that couponing program. They'll review all their medications yes. and make decisions about what they can do to try to put them into a lower cost category. But, right, to, to be clear, I just want to make sure I understand this, to, to be clear, even with that laser, if we don't get that couponing, it's still a net savings of 45,000. 45, yeah. yes, it's sir. potentially just a greater savings right. if we are able to, to do that. That's if we have to cover the cost? Yeah, the, the lasering is, is, is capped at $900,000. On our stop loss, we already have a $550,000 ISL. So that right. difference is $350,000. Right. So they offered us a, 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 a fixed fee of 2093000 which is 399000 less than the fixed cost fee from HM. So that difference is about a $48,000 savings gotcha. uh, to the district, even if the lasering remains. Okay. I agree. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll call the vote at this time. All those in favor? Any by the same sign? Very good. Motion passes. Thank you for your work. I appreciate Thank that. You. Thanks for that explanation, Thank Mr. Rice. That was a good explanation. Yes, sir. Yep. What they're talking about. Now I feel like I Okay, I'd like to call this meeting into rest into a recess and turn the time over to Dr. Noll. All right. At this time, we're going to move directly into our public hearing as Mr. Rice uh, gets himself resituated there. Uh, we will now begin our uh, public hearing to discuss our budget and proposed tax rate for the year, and Mr. Rice will give that presentation. Right. Good evening, President Hubert, members of the board, Dr. Nolan, community members. It is my pleasure to present the 2021-2022 proposed budget. First, I would like to thank the finance office staff for their work on the budget this year. Ms. Karen Garza is here this evening, and I know the rest of the finance staff are watching on YouTube, so thanks to them. I would also like to thank the CISD, bo CISD board for participating in our numerous board workshops on the budget, and we appreciate your input and guidance you provided over the last seven months. Mr. Moore, thank you for participating in the Compensation Committee. Mr. Hubert, thank you for your participation in the Employee Benefits Program. And Mr. Sanders, thank you for your work as Chair of the Audit Committee. Each of these processes is, is needed for the success of the district. <clears throat> Looking at our financial highlights, we will start with recognizing a few of our financial highlights for the year. We just received our first rating for the year ended August 31st, 2020, and I'm happy to announce that we received a superior rating, which is the highest rating you can receive, and we had a perfect score. We also received a clean audit from our independent auditors, Weaver, for the, for the year ended August 31st, 2020. And CISD is one of only two ISDs out of over 1,100 to receive a five-star rating, which is the highest, uh, all 12 years by Texas Smart Schools. And this is a program that was started in the state comptroller's office that rates schools both on financial and academic performance. Very proud of those highlights. So now taking a look at our transparency and our financial reporting awards, we're very proud of the awards we received for our financial transparency. CISD was the first district in the state to earn transparency awards from the state for our finance, debt, and purchasing presentations. All this information can be found on the district's transparency website. Some of the items that you will find on this website include tax rate disclosures, multiple revenue and expenditure presentations, our comprehensive annual financial report, check registers for both our payroll and AP, 
And for those that are wanting budget information, the website includes by department raw format budget information that you can download into Excel. It also includes our award-winning budget book. Now this is a 380 page presentation of the budget that drills down in the budget from an executive summary all the way to matching each department and every campus's line item budget allocation with their goals and objectives. And also this budget presentation will be on the website. And this is just a sample of the useful information that will be on our transparency website. 2021-2022 budget calendar. The budget calendar is a tool that identifies important milestones in the budget process and throughout the budget process the finance staff is working diligently to ensure our budget is fiscally responsible and that we are providing the economic resources needed so our students can be academically successful. So just looking at a uh, couple of the dates here you can see on February 2nd we had our first uh, board workshop to discuss the legislative update. This year was a legislative year so we met with the board we talked about the legislation we talked about our budget projections and goals back in February. Also in the month of February, we had our initial planning meeting with TASB to discuss our salary compensation plan for 2021-2022. Also in February, we worked on our benefits design and rate plan with our employee benefits committee and our insurance consultant Gallagher. At April 6th, we had an, an additional board workshop to discuss the budget. There, TASB pre presented the compensation plan to the board, and we also presented our benefit plan design. April 20th, we had another regular board meeting where we uh, approved our benefit plan. <clears throat> May 4th, we had an additional special board meeting and at this board meeting, uh, the board approved our compensation plan. June 15th, at the regular board meeting, we had another uh, budget presentation with the board. And then on July 14th, we had a meeting with the district level planning and decision making committee to discuss the 2021-2022 budget. And at that meeting, the uh, committee voted unanimously to approve uh, the budget and recommend it to the Board of Trustees. August 3rd, last uh, two weeks ago, we had our first public hearing on the budget and the tax rate. And then tonight, we're having our second public hearing on the budget and tax rate. And then right after this uh, public hearing, we will ask the board to adopt the budget and the tax rate. So taking a look at the major components that drive the budget, and they begin with our 2021-2022 budget objectives. And those include to meet the needs for the 2021-2022 school year. This year we're opening Hope Elementary and the, teacher, and the Jet Center. We want to provide a competitive compensation plan, and we want to continue to meet the needs as outlined in House Bill 3. This year we have our reading academies and the teacher incentive allotment. And we want to provide continued support for maintaining a safe environment for our students and staff. Taking a look at our fund balance analysis, our goal is to maintain an unassigned fund balance in the range of 20 to 25 percent of our budget. Our current unassigned fund balance is at 20 percent, at 27 percent, at 153.6 million dollars. Our target of 25 percent is 144.2 million dollars, so we have available above that of 9.4 million dollars. Now, in all of my budget presentations, we've come to this slide and I said this is the most important slide we'll look at this evening, and that is because our state revenue estimates and our campus expenditure budget allocations rely on our enrollment data. For the upcoming 2021-2022 school year, we're using an enrollment of 66,298 and an 88% percentage of 94.2%. And I think it is very important to note that the expenditure budget is based on enrollment However, state funding is provided based on our average daily attendance. Mm -hmm. Taking a look at our ESSER funding that, that we're scheduled to receive, uh, we'll start with ESSER 3, um, scheduled to receive $64.7 million. Of that, 20% is must be spent on learning loss. And within that $64.7 million, we have a reserve of $12.5 million for per, uh, possible attendance loss uh, for the year. So we're kind of safeguarding ourselves in case uh, our ADA falls due to COVID. Uh, ESSER 2 money, our application was submitted August 3rd, and so we're looking how that calculation will uh, come out because the state is using some of this for the hold harmless that they provided us in 2020-2021. And then ESSER 1, we received $6.5 million. However, the state supplanted their budget with that, and so there was net no new money to the district for those funds. Our certified property values, 
We received our certified property values on July 25th, and our property values grew at a rate of 7.46%. This growth will add about $3 billion to our property values, bringing our total value to $43.1 billion. It's very important that we understand this, that due to House Bill 3 and the state funding Robin Hood, this value increase does not provide any net new revenue to the district's general fund. It is the only source of income for our debt service fund, but in our general fund, it provides us no net new revenue. So looking at our tax rate history, um, we'll be recommending a tax rate of $1.176. This tax rate is 3.65 cents less than last year. And if you look since 2018, 2019, our tax rate has actually decreased by 10.4 cents. We always like to compare ourselves with our tax rate to the greater Houston area. You can see CISD there in the red. We're the third lowest tax rate in the greater Houston area at $1.17.6. The school districts in the dark blue, those are our local Montgomery County school districts. And the school districts in the green, those are our peer school districts. And those school districts, not only do we compare them financially, but we also compare with them academically. So now that we have discussed the major components that drive the budget, we will now look at the effect that they have on the budget itself, starting with the 2021-2022 funding estimate. <clears throat> so our local revenue, based off of our AV growth, you can see that generates $11.38 million. Based on House Bill 3, that is capped at 2.5% growth. However, you will see, due to Robin Hood, our state funding is decreased dollar for dollar. We lose $11.38 eight million dollars so net zero increase uh, from those AV growths we do have uh, a little increase in our state funding based on the fast growth calculation and special programs of 2.77 million we're needing to decrease our interest revenue by 1.6 million dollars because as we all are aware interest rates are, are kind of in the tank uh, TRS in kind funds this is a entry that we have to make It's an accounting entry we're required to make 2.5 million dollars so total estimated funding increase this year for the district is 3.67 million dollars so moving to the expenditure side of the budget we will take a look at this year's pay increase and we will start with the TASB salary study TASB stands for <coughs> Texas Association of School Boards and they conduct a comprehensive study of salaries, stipends, and pay practices for Texas public school districts. Participation ensures the district has access to the most recent market data available to pay competitive salaries and hire the best employees. And this also allows the district to evaluate our compensation plan as compared to districts in, in our area that are hiring from the same applicant pool. So based on our salary study, this is the approved 2021-2022 general pay increase. It includes a 3% raise for all employees, our bus drivers will receive a 5% pay increase, and they will also have a starting driver rate of $18 per hour. All of our hourly employees that are on the pay plan will receive at least $12 per hour. This cost of this pay increase is $12.5 million. This is our approved 2021-2022 teacher hiring schedule. Once again, a 3% general pay increase. So all returning teachers will receive $1,800. And our starting teacher salary is now $58,500. So looking at our personnel allocations, at the campus level, allocations are based on per student allocations. Some of these are mandated by TEA, and others are best practices that we have learned over the years. We have also found best practices for areas like custodial, based on our benchmarking with other districts and the industry standards. We have learned that we can allocate a custodian for every 28,000 square feet in a building. In transportation, we have routing software that creates the most efficient routes to pick up and drop off, drop off our students. So what we're seeing here is a sample uh, staffing formula, and this is the one for our elementary and intermediate schools. This is the staffing formulas at our junior high schools. And this is the staffing formulas that we have at our high schools. And each one of these staffing formulas are in detail in the budget book that I talked about on our transparency website. So based off of our hiring schedules that we just talked about, our 2021-2022 personal, personnel additions are for support at the campus level for new students in the opening of Hope Elementary. It includes 35 and a half new positions consisting of 19 and a half teachers, three administrators, six professional, and seven paraprofessionals, and this is at a cost of $2.1 million. 
And then to support our campuses, we're adding 42 and a half new positions. And this is mainly in our transportation and custodial departments. This will be at a cost of $1.5 million. So in total, it's 78 new positions at a cost of $3,595,000. So this is our projected expenditure budget increase for 2021-2022. Once again, our general pay increase is $12.5 million. Additional personnel for HOPE and other programs is $3.6 million. We are going to recommend a retention stipend, uh, two of them actually, in the total amount of $10 million. We have other expenses that include utilities, insurance, and supplies, $500,000. We have a reduction in our budget of $10 million. To, uh, a payment to our capital maintenance fund that the board took care of this year from our fund balance. Then the offset to the TRS in kind uh, entry from the revenue side, $2.5 million for total expenditure increase of $19.13 million. So just talk to you all real quickly about retention stipends. Um, we feel that they are great tools to help manage the long-term budget. It provides compensation to retain employees. They boost job satisfaction and productivity. They're very budget friendly because it is only one time money and not a perpetual expenditure and can be adjusted based on available funding. This year we are recommending two separate retention stipends that'll total $10 million. The first retention stipend will be paid on October 1st and then February 15th will be the second one and that will depend on ADA and bu budget availability. So this is our 2021-2022 proposed budget. On the revenue side, our beginning revenue was $582.45 million. We had a total revenue increase of $3.67 million for a total revenue of $586.12 million. On the expenditure side, our beginning expenditure was $576.99 million. Our estimated total expenditure increase is $19.13 million. Our estimated total expenditures of $596.12 million. We are using $10 million of COVID relief funding from 2020, 2021 that we received from the county, and that will give us a balanced budget. This is a pie chart that shows our budget by major object. Uh, you can see the blue area, that is our payroll, that is 89.7% of our budget. We're a very uh, people intensive organization. Contracted services is the second highest level of expenditures, that's 4.7%. The largest item in there is our utility bill for our buildings. Supplies and materials makes up 4.2% of our budget, and the largest item in there is fuel for our buses. Equipment and other is 1.4% of the budget, and the largest individual item in there is property insurance for our buildings. So our proposed budget is $596,120,000. This is the format that we'll be requesting the board to adopt uh, the budget in just a moment. And this is the notice of public meeting that was on our website and in the Conroe Courier uh, describing this meeting tonight. <coughs> All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Rice. We're going to transition the podium back here. At this time, we will have an opportunity for public comment on the budget hearing. If you uh, would like to make a comment on the budget, if you would please make your way to the podium. Once again, you'd have two minutes. If you would state your name, and you'd have two minutes to make a comment. Okay, seeing none, that will conclude our budget hearing. Uh, Mr. Hubert, the meeting is yours once again. Very good, thank you very much. Moving on to item 7A, consider approval of 2021-2022 official school budget auction All right, this time Mr. Rice will come back. Yes, good evening Mr. Hubert, member of the board, Dr. Knoll. It is my pleasure to recommend the Board of Trustees approve the 2021-2022 official school budget as has been discussed in our board workshops, as presented in the public hearings, and as recommended by the district level planning and decision making committee. At this time, I recommend your approval. All right, do we have a motion? I move the approval of the budget as presented. We have yes, a, sir. a motion and a second. Any conversation, questions, thoughts? I'd like to make a yeah. comment. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Rice and finance team and everyone else involved, thank you. The efforts that go in 
to this budget are not small by any stretch. To have multiple uh, meetings with the board means multiple meetings that you have to have before we even get to see something. And I just want to commend you and your team and everyone that's involved. I mean, seven takes seven months to get prepared for our next school year's budget. And that tells me the amount of detail that goes into this planning. And uh, there's a lot of number crunching involved and there's a lot of moving parts. And I just want to say thank you for staying on top of it. And I just want you to know we appreciate you. Thank you, sir. I would absolutely second that. Um, the level of detail that's gone into this uh, is just, you know, quality work. And y'all and your your team deserves all those accolades um, that we saw. So thank, thank you. you for that. I did also have a question. Yes. <laughs> um, regarding the attendance, can you remind me what is the what is the the loss of revenue for like hundred students is. Well, we do it in percentages. Okay. You know, we budget 94.2% for our average daily attendance, and for mm -hmm. every percentage point below that, the district will lose $2.5 million. 2.5 yes, percent. And just to, just to be fair, uh, you know, that we would normally be about 95% for normal attendance. Uh, mm -hmm. Yesterday, we were at 89%. Yeah. So our enrollment, uh, actually tomorrow, our enrollment will exceed um, our projection, so we will, we will be above projected enrollment. But if you know, the risk at this point is with average daily attendance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and we need to get through this current wave of COVID and illness because it's uh, that will become an issue if it's a long-term um, yeah. piece. And we have approximately 500-ish students in mm -hmm. the virtual. Oh, excuse me. He's, I think it's 688 in my. Almost 700. 700. 700. 700. Yes. Okay. Which no funding. They they will not be funded. No. Mm -hmm. So now some of uh, that Dr. Medford might could speak to this, uh, or, or Ms. Ross possibly could, but I think most of those children are already not attending class. So they're showing up currently in the absence okay, uh, so it's not piece in, already. So it's not yeah, going to be another yeah, okay. another whole group coming out. They're already not <clears throat> attending. So yeah. uh, we're, we're, we're already seeing that. Uh -huh. Okay. Any other thoughts or questions? Well, I wanted to commend this board as well mm -hmm. for all of the meetings that you guys have shown up to and all the questions. I know that we've been on the phone, Mr. Rice and your team personally on discussing some of these issues. And I know that you've been talking personally with everybody else on the board. So it's a lot of effort on your part and a lot of effort on our part. We, we This is probably one of the main reasons we're here on the board is to manage the budget and the tax rate and we take it very serious and we appreciate it. I just wanna say thank you to this board for your diligence as well and, and putting your time into this. So thank you for that. All right, that being said, I'll call, call the vote. All those in favor of approval? Any opposed by the same sign? All right, unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Item B, consider adopt and set by order resolution, re resolution the 2021 ad valorem tax rate to support the 2021-2022 budget, maintenance and operation tax rate, and debt services tax rate. All right. All right. Tonight we are recommending the Board of Trustees approve the attached order resolution to adopt a 2021 tax rate of 91.6 cents for maintenance and operation, 26 cents for debt service per $100 value, uh, to fund the 2021-2022 official school budget. As, as has been presented and discussed in the budget workshops and public hearings, the above noted tax rates are required to fund the maintenance and operations and debt service budgets for the 2021-2022 fiscal year. Just for note, we, we do remember that House Bill 3 that TEA calculates the district's m and tax rate. They give us the option of our five golden pennies that we do take advantage of. And then also per House Bill 3, the state funding formula and the district's gain on appraisal value growth is net zero. So we see the appraisal value growth go out there, but it is a net zero gain to the district with that mm -hmm. appraisal value growth. Um, the total combined tax rate of $1.17.6 per $100 is 3.65 cents lower than last year's tax rate. At this time, I recommend your approval. Okay. Do we have a motion? Just a program motion that we Accept the tax rate as presented. 
Okay. I think yeah. Mr. President, I'd like to amend that motion. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, bro. I, I move that the property tax rate be increased by the adoption of a tax rate of 1.176 per hundred dollars, which is effectively a 2.3 percent, 2.30 percent increase in the tax rate. All right. We have a motion. We have a second. I, second. Okay. I apologize. Could you repeat? I, I lost the last part of the sentence. Sure. Mr. Sanders had said. I move that the property tax rate be increased by an adoption of a tax rate of 1.176 per $100, which is effectively effectively a 2.30% increase in the tax rate. Okay. We have a motion. We have a second. Second. Is there any, any discussion? Uh, discussion? Yes, sir. Uh, just so it's on the record that we had this discussion right before the meeting, I understand if we knock this down one more penny, mm -hmm. Which there's, you know, there's maybe some people would like to that discussion. That it actually, it wouldn't cost us four million. You mentioned a golden penny, and just so the record shows us, a golden penny, as many of us know, is a double penny. And that's the first penny we got to take off. Yes, so sir. we would lose eight million dollars for every one penny we lowered. That is correct. Okay, I just wanted, I, I, I want to make sure that I understood that correctly, and also get that and, on the record. Yeah, and, and four, four million of that would be local funds, and mm -hmm. then four million would be state funds. So we oh, would be good. leaving yeah. four million of state funding. Uh, on the table as well yeah, good. if we did that good, good okay thank you so much for explaining that again thank you anything else all right hearing none call the vote all those in favor show by the uplifted hand any opposed by the same sign very good motion carries unanimous thank you very much good job all right well done guys right. item 7c receive financial report all right Ms. also like to take a minute to commend the finance staff you know Darren and I have the privilege of standing up here every month and presenting the financial statements and just there are countless hours that go into every one of these numbers that are presented on the balance sheet and income statement from reconciling cash to running payroll to paying invoices so thank you to our entire staff for, for all they do each and every day to to make it happen so um, President Hubert, members of the board, and Dr. Nall, I am here this evening to present the financial statements for the month ended July 31st. The first statement this evening is the balance sheet. Presented here is the general fund, the debt service fund, child nutrition, and self-funded insurance. Our total assets in the general fund are $237.1 million. This is our income statement. Our income statement shows the district's revenues and expenditures. Our total revenue in the general fund is at $540.7 million. <coughs> in debt service, $102.9 million. Child nutrition, $17.9. Self-funded insurance, $51 million. Our debt service expenditures are at $75 million for the year. We did process our second debt payment of the year on Friday in the amount of $29 million, roughly. So you will see that reflected next month in the in the expenditure category for debt service this is our local revenue in more detail property taxes um, obviously the largest generator in the general fund and debt service fund in child nutrition food sales and then in self-funded insurance premium contributions this is our 2019 bond referendum update funds expended and encumbered to date is 273.2 million estimated to complete 378.2 million Self-funded insurance, as we anticipated, July was a very busy month for the plan. We did have revenue of 4.4 million, expenditures of a little over 5 million for a net loss of 583,000 for the month. We are still holding at a net gain for the year of 68,000, but given the history of the way August performs, we are anticipating another deficit month in the plan. We are trending about where we were in July at this time in August, but there's no way to predict what mm -hmm. claims are going to do in the next two mm -hmm. weeks. So we will watch that over the next uh, next couple of weeks and bring you an update at next, me next month's meeting. Um, averaging at the Wellness Center visits is 342 for the year. Our investments as of July 31st, 552.6 million. The pools are yielding 0 0.083. Wood Forest at 0.13. Our longer term investments with TCG are at 0.9875 and our combined portfolio is at just over 17 basis points compared to our 90 day T-bill, which is our benchmark at 0.05. Mm -hmm. I have one 
question or, or request, and, and I honestly don't, this may be a, a Mr. McCorder or Dr. Hines question okay. as well. Uh, only being five days into the school year, I know looking at the, at the nutrition, child nutrition, and the main source of income or only source of income there is food sales with us offering free and reduced lunch to every student this year. How are we going to be tracking what impact that has? I mean, that's not going to be a huge number over the overall budget. And are we getting refunded in any of that money? Or is that just something we're well, providing? Well, we will be filing with the, the federal government for reimbursement for those free meals. So we will see that on the back side as revenue for those meals that are given to those children. It's as not, as we're sales, not funding it. The right. federal government's right. funding That's it. I just wanted that, yes. wanted that clear. Indeed. Yes. Yeah, Mr. Moore, what we did see last year with our really inability to sell a la carte mm -hmm. items because most of the kids were going through the free and reduced line, that is really kind of the money generator for the child nutrition program. And so we actually did see a decrease in fund balance throughout the year. So we are anticipating seeing that fund balance in child nutrition continue to decrease this year, even though we are getting reimbursement prices for those meals. Okay. And worthy too, yesterday we did tie an all-time high to much is sold to kids. Hmm. Kids are lining up for the free lunch. And breakfast. They are. 27,000? A little over 27,000 per day. Fabulous. 27,000. Thank you. All right, very good. Thank you very much. Moving on to item eight, executive session. A closed session of the board will now be held on the matters contained in the notice for the meeting as authorized by section 551.071 and 551.074 of the Texas Open Meeting Act. Should the board determine that any final action, final decision, or final vote be required with regard to any matter considered in such closed or executive meeting or session, then such final action, such decision, or final vote shall be at either the a, this public meeting upon the reconvening of the public meeting, or B, at a subsequent public meeting on the board no, upon notice thereof, as the board shall determine. The closed session of the board will now be held. The time is 821. The board is now in open session at 9.08. The next item on the agenda is to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. And motion and a second. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank Let's you very much. Good night, everyone. Thank you.